Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I've practiced as a geotechnical engineer for over 17 and a half years. In addition to practicing engineering, I enjoy mentoring young engineers and first-generation college students. I've focused on helping to increase the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields. STEAM is science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, which I may sometimes refer to as the Geopod, I'll be talking to John Grillo, PE. Mr. Grillo is a project executive at Keller North America Incorporated. He's been a member of the Keller team since 2011 and has over 15 years of experience as a geotechnical engineer and specialty contractor. John is currently the ground improvement division manager for the Rockaway office. John has been involved with the design and construction of excavation support, underpinning, micropiles and macropiles, secant pile walls, auger cast piling, ground improvement, and driven piling projects, mostly in the private sector. He's also involved in the research and development of drilling techniques and the procurement of equipment and tooling to help keep Keller as an innovator and ahead of the competition. John is a licensed professional engineer in the state of New York and also in the state of New Jersey. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from Manhattan College and a Master of Engineering degree from Cornell University. Outside of Keller, John is currently the Secretary of the Board of Directors of the ADSC Northeast Chapter and is the past Chairman of the ASCE Geo Institute of Met Section. Very recently, just a few weeks ago, BNR Engineering News Record New York just listed their 2021 top young professionals and these 20 under 40 include Mr. John Grillo. And with that, let's jump right into our conversation with John. John, welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. We're honored to have you. How are you feeling, man? I'm good. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the invite and I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Excellent. Well, if you could, in your own words, can you tell the listeners a little bit more about, let's say, your daily routine? Like, what does it look like working at Keller as John Grillo? (laughs) So I do a little bit of everything. I'll make coffee in the morning and uh, no, but for real, um, you know, my my job at Keller is to... um, is to promote and build the ground improvement business for our region. Um, and for me, that includes uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, eastern half of Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Um, I'm responsible for um, you know, going out and getting work and managing work and contract negotiation, uh, billing and invoicing, cradle to grave on jobs. Uh, not as much um, uh, being a soldier project manager that I used to be a bit more in a, in a management role now with, with, uh, with a group of project managers that, that I work with to, uh, to uh, get through the, the, the jobs. Got it, got it. So it sounds like you're seeing from beginning to end, really, in a lot of the back of house, as they would say, it, for, for the whole division, right? For ground improvement? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. That's great. And I guess if the, as a ground improvement division manager, you know, when I think of ground improvement or when I think of foundation design, uh, one of the questions, you know, before you just say we're going to have a deep foundation is what can we do with that soft ground? Can we improve it? Or if there are poor site fills, can we improve them? And that's really what your focus is. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about the improvement technologies that are out there? Like, how do you actually improve the ground? Sure. So the, the main technologies that there's there's two main technologies that that we use for um, for uh, mostly for building foundation and uh, in a lot of like the intermediate structure where it's not too heavy, uh, where you would have to get something that's uh, a, a deep foundation. Uh, typically, we do a lot of stone columns, aggregate piers, and and rigid inclusions. Uh, those are two main techniques. I mean, there's also you know there's there's all sorts types of grouting grouting you can do for ground improvement as well, but mainly uh, the focus that I work on is typically aggregate piers and rigid inclusions. Because uh, really, I mean, there's um, there's buildings like logistics centers and um, 
you know, uh, the uh, three to four story wood frame residentials that are uh, going up all over the place. And, th and they're really not too heavy. Um, so when the ground just needs a little bit of help, um, that, that's where a ground improvement can, can, can save the owners and developers a fair amount of, of money versus say um, driving piles or drilling structural piles. Makes sense. And I imagine for slabs as well, like you wouldn't want to pile support a slab if you're sitting on the exactly, ground. Exactly. Right. You'd, you'd have slab on grade over ground improvement for sure. Okay. And can you break down those two different types just for, you know, for the listeners that haven't done any of this before? Sure. Um, for a, a structural slab, essentially as if you had a, um, the second floor of a building would be a, a, a concrete slab. That would be a structural slab. I Meaning you're not, you know, would count on any of the support from the soil below it. So you would install a uh, structural deep foundation element, you know, at, at some type of grid similar to columns in a building to support that slab. Um, if you're using ground improvement and using a slab on grade, um, you're counting on the ground to provide the support uh, for that slab and to control settlement um, differential in total. Uh, but what you're doing is you're improving the ground to accept those, those deformation limits. Got it. And if you have a lot of different types of ground improvement techniques, you know, how do you know which one's going to be appropriate for a job? Of course, it depends. But, you know, what are you looking at to determine which way you'll go? So um, a lot of that uh, starts uh, at the beginning. I always joke around like, and like you know, there's a big pile of stuff to do. And where do you begin? It's the beginning. Yeah. So uh, I, I kind of take it in a progression. Like what's what's the least amount of work we can do? And is that and I don't mean at the least, like not good enough, but it, you know, you, you don't want to, I don't want to overscope a job and do too much work. So if we look at something similar to like a, a compaction technique, like a rapid impact compaction, that would be like the least amount of work I could do on a job. Mm -hmm. um, does that, does that fit the bill? Well, no, like, well, then the next bucket is uh, say aggregate peers and that works really good. Um, you know, typically up to about 40 feet. I can go deeper. I've gone deeper, uh, but you don't always need to go. So if you can get that 40 foot up to 40 foot range where you don't have very thick, thick soft layers, that is it. That's going to do excellent job, excellent job improving that ground. And then if you have the next level up from there would be the ridge inclusion, uh, which is going to give you uh, ability to bridge through um, like uh, deeper deposits of softer material. Excellent. Excellent. And, you know, I say before you were focusing in on ground improvement, because I mean, when I knew you, I thought of you as a deep foundation guy. You know, we we're talking about drilled piles and, you know, caissons and things of that sort of mini piles. But uh, you made a transition from being, you know, focusing in on deep foundations to more ground improvement. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that transition looked like or looks like? I mean, I don't know if you're still in it or you or it's done, but can you walk us through that a little bit? No, I tell you that that's, I, I've t I tell the story a lot because it's, it's been, um, it's, it's been uh, a wonderful journey so far. Nice. <laughs> That's how I describe it. Uh, I can describe it. So um, just about two years now, then this August, is two, it, August, 2020 is two years where, um, you know, they said, Hey, like, you just start looking at ground improvement here. Cause like, that's a market where we're not doing a lot of in this area, but there, there, there's market share out there. And, you know, when we do this stuff, you know, all over the country, but not as much here. So can you, can you, let's, let's grow this business. And I was like, okay, challenge accepted. This is great. And you could do that about 50% of the time. You do your structural foundations and all other stuff. Um, the other 50% of the time. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so um, I quickly found out that, you know, like it's, you got to be all in. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to do this. You know, I can't be half pregnant on the, on this stuff, you know? Um, I quickly found out like I had a really hard time juggling it. Like, I had to like really focus in and understand the ground improvement because it was a lot different than what I was doing. Cause previously, Oh, I'm going to drill a pile through that. I'm going to bypass that material. Yeah. Now it's like, wait, wait, hold on. Now I got to work with the material. Um, <laughs> let me, let me, let me kind of dust off some of those books and, you know, draw some more circles and, and, and go from there. Okay. Uh, so it was really good to kind of, you know, it was, it was, it was humbling. Because, I, you know, I had to refresh things that I had learned a long time ago mm -hmm. and, and use those techniques that I haven't used in a while to, um, to really uh, understand and learn the ground improvement. I really had immersed myself in it to understand and, 
and get a feel for it. I mean, I, 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 as you know, you, you are, you are a huge Ralph Peck fan. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the dear book about him, about judgment, geotechnical engineering, like, I love judgment. You know what? You know I love that, right? Yeah, so like, I didn't have a spidey sense. Okay. <laughs> for ground improvement. Yeah. You know what? You know, I could look at a micro pile and be like, ah, you know, it's full of PSI, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, your box stress. I didn't have that, you know? And so I've, I, I've, I've really had to build up a, uh, a sense of trust from what I was calculating or figuring out what it's going to be and understanding and a feel for, for how to use it and how to use it appropriately. Got it. Got it. And then every project that's completed is another data point, right? So oh, it kind, of, for sure. kind of calibrates the spidey sense in a, in, mm-hmm. in, a, in a way. Now, what are you doing as far as uh, confirmation? Like after you have improved the site, are you going back and uh, doing CPTs or borings to improve? Or I mean, So depending on the project requirements, uh, typical structural support job, a structural foundation that's that's not dealing with things like liquefaction or, uh, or, or, or things like in that nature. Um, uh, a, uh, an aggregate peer will do a modules test on con- confirm the design stiffness of the peer we had assumed okay. the design. We're doing a, a, a single element load test on, on a rigid inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, similar verification tests you would use in a, in a, in a structural pile. Um, and as far as, um, the, like you mentioned, the, the post CPT or SBT, um, we've done some work um, for uh, for ground improvement that also doubled as liquefaction mitigation. Hmm. So doing that, we've gone back and we we we've, we've pushed cones. Um, you know, and we've done them radially from say an aggregate pier, you know, away from the center for you know how much you know, check the 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 furthest point away and you know, and is that good? And as you get closer, how much better does it get? And How's your factor of safety for liquefaction and post earthquake settlements in that nature? Got it, got it, got it. And as far as on the geotech, um, on the front end of what you would need in order to bid on a job, borings, CPTs, specific lab tests. I mean, what <laughs> I imagine more is better than less. But uh, what's on your wish list? Did you do um, definitely uh, SPTs and CPTs? Okay. Um, you know, the SPTs to, uh, physically touch it and classify it and get some, get some sieves and some limits. Um, you know, consolidation data is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and the CPTs are valuable because it's continuous information. You're getting, a, you're getting a whole bunch of data points and you have a whole, a whole lot of correlation data you can grab from those points. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm not the biggest I, I get a little um, fuzzy uh, when you're overloaded with N values, and I feel like you can you can see more clearly with the CPTs personally. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, on, on some of those data, because uh, you, if you really get into the weeds and you want to correct some N values, you're gonna you you can keep going down the rabbit hole, and so the CPTs kind of straighten you out a bit. <laughs> and, um, kind of go from there. And I mean, the, the scale of the job will tell you the scale of how much more testing we can typically ask for and get, you know? Makes sense. Makes sense. And do you find yourself doing more work within say uncontrolled fill that was present at the site or are you more in native material that's just soft? Uh, I'd say it's a good mix of both. Okay. Got it. Um, I've did some jobs where there was a concern uh, where there was uh, you know, uncontrolled fill. And so Essentially, the because the sand below it was in great shape, so essentially our aggregate pier system, kind of that job I'm thinking about was ten feet on center. We did thirty inch diameter piers, ten feet on center, and at that mm-hmm. point we had proofed out the the the, the upper fill layer and is very comfortable with the way it would behave at that point. So, got it, got you know, it, got and, it. and you know, and the, the plans behind me were for uh, for another job we did in North Jersey and. And that was actually a liquefiable project, and that was um, that was deeper aggregate piers in all native material. Oh wow! We didn't have any fill. We only had like two feet of fill at the top. That was you know it was all loose sands. You're into it at that point. Mm-hmm. Excellent, excellent. And from what I know of you, you you've always tried to be on the cutting edge when it comes to research and development of drilling techniques in particular. 
but what are some of the latest techniques you've been implementing or hope to implement in the future? And of course, you don't have to give any trade secrets, but you know, if there's something that some of our uh, younger listeners, younger geotechnical listeners may not have heard about that you feel comfortable sharing. Well, yeah, I mean, w- one, one technique that I, that I spoke to you about a while ago was when, um, when we brought KCFA technology over here. Mm. Yeah, um, that was that was the, I fought hard to bring that here and use it, and it's been very effective. And mm-hmm. um, that was always a, 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 that's still a great technology, and in the right spot, it's definitely the, the right technique. But mm-hmm. as of late, I've been doing uh, more work with um, you know installation of stone columns, um, you know, do pre drill, do not pre drill, how much energy does the vibrator have, how big can you build stone, and on the rigid inclusion side, it's, it's been the tooling, you know, heavy R and D focus in the tooling. What if we what if we change the cutter head around and you know, what about the grout orifice in the side? How big is that? Is it a bottom discharge, a side discharge? What size drill rods? There's all sorts of different variables that um, you know, you try and tweak not too much at once so you can see what your control is. Got it, got it, got it. And how does that yeah. work? You go to the shop and you say, I want to change this element right here, and then they change it and they test it and they get back to you? Like how does that what does that process look like? Well, you know, some of that stuff comes down to necessity sometimes. Okay. Uh, you get, you get, if you get in a job and the tool comes back, it's really worn. And this one side of the tool is really worn. I'm like, oh, maybe turn the tooth out a little bit and see what, you know, see what happens. And, okay. Um, you know, it, it, all sorts of different, you know, Frankenstein tools that you end up making. And like, oh, that one worked good. We got to use that one again. Or, um, you know, and like those paths kind of run parallel with, you know, some of the equipment manufacturers, that things that they're making. Um, and they're like, Hey, I got this new thing. And I'm like, Oh, you know, let me put this and this together. And, you know, it's, um, it's exciting. I mean, that's just, I, the stuff that kind of gets me excited, you know, excited. The, the tooling is definitely something that's always like, Oh yeah, there's, there's, there's a better way. I know there's a better way, you know? Yeah. 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 I remember when you, um, you know, I remember when you started your career, you really, you know, you're in consulting. And when you made that transition over to working for a contract, you, you really used to talk to me a lot about, you know, well, think about how it goes together, right? It's right. like, you can't just spec something. You got to think about how it goes together and how it's actually works. So that's pretty cool. Like, I think you had to go to drilling school when you started too, right? Yeah. We, yeah. Some, some of our um, internal programs were, were very helpful with, um, you know, why we do it, things a certain way or how we do it, or just even standing next to the driller. Yeah. Um, it's a very different perspective. Like when I, when I came to work as a contractor mm-hmm. and I went and stood next to the driller that was on the same payroll I was on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, and I'm like, Hey, why do you do this? Why do you do, why don't you do that? Like, you know, things that like, you know, I, I, I previously had a different opinion of before, mm-hmm. and, you know, and you know, there, there's, there, there's, there's, um, you know, this is why we do this. And, and, and like it made a lot of sense, you know, Makes to sense. be able to get that, first-hand perspective um when you know the driller doesn't think you're someone who's trying to bug him like you work together yeah exactly <laughs> right? we're, on the, we're on the same team same squad right yeah yeah <laughs> oh that's good and, and that reminds me like soft skills i mean a lot of what we learn in school a lot of it's book smarts right it's understanding the calculations understanding the parameters understanding the theory behind it you may get an internship experience or a co-op and you get that practical experience but soft skills are really important as you start to move up the ladder and yeah. you know, what, what would you say for how you learn those and you know, what it's meant for you professionally? Um, you know, I've learned some hard lessons, you know, I mean, it's, um, you, you, you got to work on your approach and, uh, learn how to lead a conversation and, um, you know, and, and, and to be empathetic. I mean, empathy, I think is kind of a word I use very often as a mm. late, wow. um, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, even say in a meeting with like a developer or somebody, mm-hmm. this developer could be, you, if you don't have, if you have empathy for what they're going through or like, you know, they know that if they have to go to a, a, a heavy duty foundation, like the job's not happening, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, how can, how can I, I'm, I'm empathetic to what you got and, and you know, I'm going to be here for you and, and fulfill that role. And, um, and even, even in general, like I, I always kind of using that empathy is just, just switching over to the, um, you know, just even in the office and with different personalities and, you know, having empathy is good as well, but also understanding, uh, the other party's worldview. Like they have a view that they've built up with, you know, in their life with, you know, the, how they got to be where they are. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there, there's a, there's a view and a perspective that, that they come to the table with. And so being empathetic of where that may come from or why they may say a certain thing would be very helpful in 
and leading or directing a conversation. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you don't take into consideration somebody's motivational values, you could completely say something that kind of spins them in the wrong direction as opposed to encouraging them. So that's, that, that takes a lot of work. And, you know, I, I think that people think of engineers as not having that skill set, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you take that and you get some energy and enthusiasm and, and um, you know, and you, you're going to have a couple of days stumbling, you know, and then all of a sudden it'll click a little bit and it'll get better and better. Um, just, you know, it's gotta, you got to keep working at it. It doesn't, you know, you, you know, it doesn't start on day one. No, not at all. <laughs> Not even week one or month one. It takes take some time. Yeah, it takes some sure. time. Now, when you think about your team and, you know, building your team, you know, that relationship between the manager and the staff. I have to imagine that um, there have been some challenges, but I have to imagine there are some things that are really rewarding about, you know, what that looked like. What can you share with the listeners? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the group of people I work with is great. I, I'm, I'm fortunate in my position to have the people that I work with. You guys are a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, you know what the, the 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 group that I'm working with right now, they're 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 into it and they have passion and drive and emotion, which 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 works good because I have that stuff too, right? Yeah, so kind of, you know, it's like we build each other up and it, it's nice and like you know, I feel like my job is to kind of raise them up and like give them the confidence to make the decisions they know how to make, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and like grow as a team because you know every time there's a new job, we're all learning something new. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I've never done the same job twice. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> it's the benefit of geotech, right? Right. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's every, every, every job's a new opportunity to do better than the last one and learn something new, right? There you go. You could be across the street. It's like, oh, it's totally different here than it was over there. <laughs> Not what I expected. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's why they call it practicing geotechnical engineering, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What advice do you think you could give for uh, geotechs that may be considering a move from, say, like a staff or senior staff level moving into management or, or more leadership roles? What, what advice would you share? You know, don't, don't be afraid to take a chance. Like a little risk is okay. Hmm. You know, calculate your risk, understand, you know, what your, bene- what, what your benefits could be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, one thing I learned once was not call it a negative, call it a delta. Get your pluses hmm. and your deltas. So understand okay. your pluses and delta, do your analysis, yeah. and, you know, and, and understand which way it can go. I mean, work hard, keep your nose down, learn everything you can. Um, because I think part of being, you know, getting to that managed managerial role is, um, you know, having the, uh, besides the technical, you have, the, you have emotional intelligence, and technical intelligence, and you need to use those both um, to, uh, to, uh, to put that team together and put the right people in the right spots. Excellent. Excellent. I know that throughout your career, you've been pretty active in uh, the professional societies. Anything you could share there as far as how to get more involved or why one would want to be more involved? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, um, that was, uh, that's, that's always like a near and dear place to me, the professional societies. I mean, you and I were on a committee together once upon yeah. a time <laughs> and, um, really, you know, the societies that, you know, uh, you know, that, that meant a lot to me, I, you know, I, I went to their events, um, you know, I, I know that they look for different people to be on their board of directors or their, or their officers of the com- or the committee, whatever they call it. And, um, you know, when I heard there's an opening coming up, you know, I started talking to the, the, that current leadership and saying, Hey, I'm interested. And, you know, when you kind of work your way in, because, you know, I, I, you know, forget that I work for, Ke- for Keller. I, I love working for Keller. It's a great company, mm-hmm. but I love this industry. Yeah. You know, and like, awesome. I, and I want to see the industry be better also. Yeah. You know, and so it's, 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 I think it's a great thing to uh, be part of something besides, um, you know, j- just your company, you're part of the industry, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's really powerful when you think about it. Cause you know, we were in class and we're, you know, learning about what it means to be a geotechnical engineer. And then after you do it for some years, and when you're a part of actually making the industry better, there's something really powerful about having that opportunity, you know? So, yeah. I mean, listen, you meet a lot of great people on the road too. I mean, you really do. I mean, you work with a lot of great people. I work with a lot of great people, Yeah. but uh, there's a lot more of them out there. There's a lot more. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick moment to take a break. And we're going to come back just after a moment and we're going to finish this up with John as we have our career factor of safety in segment. Stick around.
Welcome back. It's time for our career factor of safety in segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. And we talked about that a little bit today with our guests. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with none other than John Grillo, PE. John, the work that you do involves a lot of risk to both you and your staff, as well as to the community in some sense. How have you built a factor of safety in your career, as well as those that you manage, to give yourselves a factor of safety when working on construction sites as it relates to safety? Um, so the factor of safety for safety uh, <laughs> should be pretty high. Uh, one thing that um, our safety team says pretty often is, let's go from I think it's safe to I know it's safe. Mm -hmm. You know, and that really stick, stuck with me because, you know, this, this, this industry is awesome. It's also dangerous. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think it makes sense to know what you're doing is safe. Yeah. You know, on the job site, did, 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 we, did, we, uh, did we secure the load? Um, how are we picking this tool off the truck? Mm. Like, is that, is that safe? You know, like that's, you know, I, I think that's totally worth even the extra minute you need just to check, check the rigging. And that's, and that, that's to me a, a, very, a very simple thing that is always like, hey, guys, take your time. Guys, it's really hot today, guys. Drink some water. Yeah. You know, it's really important to do those things. Makes a lot of sense. It's usually when uh, folks are cutting corners that, that uh, something silly happens. And like you say, it really only takes a moment to just think about it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that's great. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on. And thank you for sharing all the great insights that you did with, um, the, with this talk. And thank you for your service to the industry. We really appreciate what you're doing for the engineering community. Now, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for listeners to reach you? Uh, social media or email address? Yeah, email is great. Uh, also, uh, LinkedIn is great as well. Those are, those are probably the two best ways to contact me. Okay, excellent. What is yeah. your email address? So my email address is jrgrillo, G-R-I-L-L-O, at keller-na.com. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, Derek. Keep up the good work. I hope you enjoyed our episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com. You will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 10, as well as links to any of the resources, websites or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.